While our field bickers amongst the walls of social media, just isolated, trying to say who's right and sharing our different opinions and such, sometimes getting into data or logic here and there, there are actual discussions in science, like science, the science that our boy Skinner published in once out of his whole career. People like Steve Hayes have been positioning their whole life. Now, mind you, this guy has over 550 publications, uh, one of the top thousand most cited people ever, like ever, and he's still positioning to publish in science. In this journal, Science, there are discussions talking about how social media can be leveraged to perpetuate the science community. These are database discussions and actual discussion articles going on in journals like this and all over the place. Now, as a behavior analyst, you probably resonate with this idea of wanting your voice to be heard, right? Today on The Daily BA, we're gonna talk about how social media could be that avenue to help really realize the dream of people like our boy Skinner here. So let's just roll that intro. I'm going to propose that if we become subject matter experts in our own field and we decide to step outside the and we decide to step outside this battle royale that is our field social media forums, listen to other fields, professions, and perspectives, and look at the data and discussions going on outside of our own pigeonholed walls, then just maybe, maybe someday we can realize that future and go from rats to Walden 2. Now this discussion is going on in full 100 total minutes at Behavior University this Tuesday. Day. The link is down below. Now I know what you're probably thinking, I want more. So today we're also going to dive into some of this, but it's just far too deep and there's way too much out there to synthesize in a short, quick video. So if you want the full thing, link below, go check it out. If not, stick around. We still have, I don't know, probably 20 minutes of content to talk about here. Also, if you're going to FABA, announcement coming at the end of this video. All right, my statements that are based on actual data, and then we'll get into opinions, and then we'll kind of wrap this thing up with some community posts from Patreon and such. So first of all, the data. Are we the only ones that are talking about professionalism and social media? No, not at all. You wanna talk about maybe doctors, pediatricians, biologists, more doctors, more doctors, the actual American Medical Association, pharmacists, another medicine one, all of these areas are having the same issues that we have. We are not isolated and alone here. And in fact, a lot of people are looking at these things and how can we actually move forward. Now I jumped into the one like pinnacle article that is in our field by O'Leary, Miller, Olive, and uh, Michelle Kelly. And this was online in 2015, actually published 2017, so there's a couple dates out there. And they, we'll get into that in a second is what it was, but I chased the links forward and backwards of that. So what's being cited and what did they sort of cite? That's a very simple starting step as to literature review, chasing backwards and forwards. Now this article proposed six things. I'm gonna read them verbatim for you, all right? Real clients should be heavily disguised, avoid making treatment recommendations, write a disclaimer if it looks like there is a recommendation, refer readers back to the literature, provide resources, and complete some organizational training around these things because they move very fast. As I said, this article is the pinnacle in our field. There is nothing really of substance specifically on this topic in our field since then, but there's a lot of information out there in other journals and other fields. Now, one that kind of got me started in this whole thing was uh, myself and Dio Ascari, the Real Behavior Man. We were checking out uh, this article from Facets, all right? Now, scientists on Twitter preaching to the choir or singing from the rooftops is what it was titled. Now, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this kind of quick quote to you as well. We analyzed the Twitter followers of more than 100 faculty members in ecology and evolutionary biology and found that their followers are, on average, predominantly, which was about 55%, other scientists. However, beyond a threshold of a thousand followers, the range of follower types became more diverse and included research and educational organizations, media, members of the public with no stated association with science and a small number of decision makers. Now, if you really dive into this, there's more context, more things to be aware of. There's this idea of this kind of million follower fallacy on social media in which uh, if you have a million, it can like create some big change and movements, but they dive in and there's a lot of bots and other things that come into into play when you get into bigger numbers. So don't take this all, you know, as like truth with a hard capital T, but it is something to be really paying attention to. And remember, there's numbers, data, science behind these sort of things. Now in another piece that I'm linking down below, I will quote, online social media tools can be some of the most rewarding and informative resources for sciences if you know how to use them. 
Now, so this, uh, I emailed these authors saying, thank you so much for this sort of line of research. This was completed in 2013. We're talking five years, five years in internet time. That's like, we're basically talking about the 1950s and internet age all of a sudden. So take this again with a grain of salt. There are more resources out there in the future. I'm gonna continue diving and putting these in. It's just a taste, remember. So they had three different figures that they looked at. The first one was audiences, very interesting. This is a free and open article, go check it out. Note the log scales and things, like they really pay attention to this. And I'll point out here on the left side that we have uh, a lot of the traditional avenues of quote disseminating and like where our guidelines are set of where we should be presenting and going and attending and whatnot. Like those are all over here, everything else is over here. And we don't have official guidelines stating what it is that we should be doing on this online matter, although we do have some in the BACB and such that are relevant to the discussion. They are not specifically about it. Now, they also break down in this article a quick little flow chart of the typical ways in which you can engage and create this sort of online community movement to try to communicate science. There's three of them. You have content creation, your community, and your curation. All right, so really pay attention to those curating because you want to talk about things that are kind of scattered all over the internet and put them in one place. Your creation is for those people that are crazy like myself that just want to really, really get into um, creating content that people can consume. And then the other one is community building, which I try to focus on a lot on this channel because it is never one person, it is a group of people. That is where you have a lot of different subject matter experts and you can really make some change and move forward. So remember those three C's. Now there's some common fears, and I think that these fears are things that our professional organizations in our field are extremely scared of actually tackling and avoiding heavily. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that these things are, are what are actually influencing and holding back our field from being in the larger limelight. So that for a few different things here. Being wrong is the first one. And you know what? You can correct it. Boom, just like you would in any other research journal and whatnot. It is okay. The next thing, being ignored or yelled at or offered, as well as institutional norms and rules. I'm curious in your perspective, I think all of these to different degrees are why we see um, almost all of our professional organizations, I've got some data on this myself, uh, just not engaging in social media whatsoever, online communication, unless they totally have to, or unless it's, um, for key things like uh, announcements, uh, giant announcements and big changes like that. Now there is an Instagram community of just awesome scientific creators. Diascari pointed me to this community. It's fantastic. One of them was extremely interesting. So Science Sam is her Instagram handle, linked down below and such as well. She published in Science. Yes, the Science, like the journal Science. Remember, it's the one that our, our boy Skinner published in. And I quote, although we agree with M. Wright, Instagram won't solve inequality quality working life 16 March page 1294 um, that there are many systemic structures perpetuating the marginalization of women in science we view social media as a powerful tool and a large strategy to dismantle such structures in addition scientists have been using social media productively to address several other concerns in academia including engaging with the public about science increasing science literacy promoting trust exploring career options networking internationally and influencing policy hmm Many of the things that I've experienced on this channel, not all of them, uh, policy and such is not a, not a thing that I get into right now uh, myself, but that is how things like this channel have formed and why we're at where we're at, like creating content with you, for you. So while we argue and bicker over how we can get our voices heard and just sometimes just chew at each other in these social forums, there's other people having informed database discussions and full conversations about how they can leverage these tools to move forward. We are severely behind in these areas, severely behind, like so far past the line and just gone that we can't even see it anymore. It's bad. Now, it's gonna be a complete rat race, and it's already kind of started, but it's gonna be a complete rat race the next few years to get to the top. And the best way to influence it is to be involved. So, start thinking about how it is that you can create the best, like the best content, like things that you are proud of, that the whole field would stand on top of the rooftops and say, this is it, this is our field, this is our science. If you're not sure yet, work with people that are extremely knowledgeable in these sort of areas. Nothing is done alone. Make sure that you have done a thorough literature review and you understand things past not only your training, but what is currently being discussed. This is what our field needs. And this is why things like my video that are coming out here soon with Steve Hayes, um, 
are really exciting for this field because people put in that work and it allows us to be situated into a much larger context and movement. With fields that we used to talk to and that we have critiqued from afar, but are now opening arms and letting us back in because we're approaching it in different ways. And we being that CBS community. Now my opinions, most of our organizations, professional organizations in this field do not value this at all. If they do, they are not actually committing and learning how to use it and leverage it. And I think it just highlights the esoteric and very uh, behind the times practices of many of our business models and infrastructure that we have in the field. Sometimes critiques from the people like myself that are out there playing around with this sort of content, um, particularly one that was very interesting on a quote that had something to do with, uh, I'm not gonna take selfies because that's not how this field really works or that's not what science is about. Um, just so you know that there is literally proof that you get 38% more engagement when you have something like a face and a personality in your content. There's a reason that some of us are doing these sort of things. There's data behind this sort of stuff. Now there was a coalition of behavior analysis uh, statement made by ABI and some other leaders in the field of behavioral science of them getting together. I made a video response to this, linked all the professional organizations I could find on Facebook, over 35 of them, and guess how many replied? Zero. Mm, take it as like a, with a grain of salt that it's not like, you know, a controlled study, but <laughs> we're not getting interaction on these platforms within our walls. Like we think we're gonna get people paying attention to us outside of it. I don't know. And to the few that are trying to step in those realms, I worked with three of them specifically this past year. Um, all of them dropped communications and did not finish following through with the commitments. And that is to be said that it's very hard to kind of push into new areas like this and it's risky and it's not clean and we were going through some bumps in some of them. But stopping communication and just walking away uh, is not the way that we're going to uh, perpetuate our field forward. We learned a thing from uh, the way that Skinner handled the Chomsky situation. Can we stop making those errors still? And lastly, automated posts about the same articles over and over again are not going to help as well. Um, it is about engagement, community building, um, that curation and actually creating content that people want to um, share and be interested in and that actually perpetuates our field for the, the whole thing that it actually is. So if I sound a little salty, um, that's just I'm very passionate about this and there's, there's literally a reinforcement and awesome things that you get experienced on one side, but then on the other side, it just totally doesn't happen. And, 80, 90% of the interactions that are just completely aversive or just pure extinction have to be with our behavioral community. And then everyone else that's leveraging in all the awesome things are almost always coming from non-behavioral communities, people in the science community, or the select few in this behavioral community that actually want to try to push the boundaries forward. So I wanna say, um, I really appreciate the people we are working with. If you resonate with this side, there is extreme value in this and I can communicate some of that to you. Just send me an email, love to discuss and chat with you more. Now, this will be one of my last posts on anything that's very heart driven about social media, at least for the rest of the year. I'm kind of done and over it. It's just, it's annoying quite frankly. Um, and there's too much great content to produce and put out there. So. One last thing is the Patreon community, the people that support this channel. I said that I would include some of what it is that you guys were curious about. So I told the community this is what I wanted to create and they came back with a couple different things. I've removed names just for the sake of anonymity um, because we don't need more drama, stuff like this. So there's some comments about the BACB code doesn't directly address um, and there's some that have some collateral re relevance, but like how do we go about these sort of things? I'm gonna dive into this much deeper in the webinar. The article by uh, Miller, O'Leary, Olive, and, and Amanda Kelly, I think I said that wrong at the beginning of this episode. That one is kind of your definitive source for the few different guidelines. It's free, it's up there, so I've linked it down below. There's another Patreon comment about asking about BCBAs and other qualified professionals putting their opinions about certain treatment protocols. Um, and it not having supportive data. Those are things that are outlined in the guidelines as well, but my personal take is that a self-policing system is not going to work. It's been demonstrated not to work super effectively. Um, not to mention, if you really dig into somebody, uh, you start to cause other problems in your life as well that um, it comes down sometimes to who's got the most resources and the biggest uh, channels to try to support their idea. Now, there's also a question about uh, these case study designs that you'll see in social media where you'll have uh, somebody that creates a quick case study on a tool, a kit, a software, etc. And then that then gets extended into 
uh, this is a tool that is good for everybody. I cannot agree more. We did an episode on case studies on the podcast, Why We Do What We Do, something I've ran on the offshoot um, for the last like year and a half. Great community, great awesome people. Linked it down below as well. Check it out. Case studies are valuable, but only in a small certain way. And you are totally correct that it is just absurd that these sort of things work. Um, again, self-policing isn't necessarily the answer. And if you do dive into the people that are trying to uh, put these out there, it gets messy and it's hard to actually do that. So we need uh, some serious reform in these areas. Now I had a couple other questions from this person on Patreon and they're just all very articulate and very well thought out. The long story short is we do not have answers for these questions as a whole. We would benefit extremely from some true instructional design technologies that teach people how to leverage these sort of things, but also what it is that the boundaries really are. Cause it's not a topographical thing, which I see so much offered on these listservs, forums and such. It is a functional approach that we should be taking to these ethical issues. It very much is the wild, wild west. There are gray lines. They're only getting grayer and they're gonna continue. And I'm gonna leave you with this quote. If a scientific community does not arrange for contingencies that assure its survival, then so much the worse for that community and the rest of the culture at large. Ed Morris, 1985. This guy's brilliant. He hangs out on listservs. You can see him at conferences. Make sure you go tell him, hey, heard about your words, read into his stuff. He's fantastic. And these words could not be more true. For me, it resonates perfectly with the situation that we have going on in our social media within behavior analysis. Now typically our responses are conservative in nature. When I say we as our professional organizations will do the bare minimum and the safest thing that they can do. They don't want to actually step into the gauntlet that is progressing into the 21st century and using tools and technology like the rest of fields out there. We need to be extremely careful on how we proceed forward. That said, we need to actually commit and take the steps forward. Social media is an undervalued and underutilized resource for almost every behavior analyst organization that's out there. It's just not leveraged in the correct ways. And clearly, I'll be the first to stand on the rooftops and advocate for its use ethically and appropriately. You have to go fast though. You cannot do these things over, you know, community work groups and such that are over years. Sorry, you're lost behind the times. But now it's time that I pass the questions off to you. What do you think? What are your thoughts down below? I'd love to hear them. That's it, that's all I got for you. That's your daily EA. I almost forgot, Faba. We're meeting up Wednesday after the BACB event with Missy Olive. It is in the program. It is at like eight o'clock, I don't know the exact room, we'll be there, giveaways, lots of cool stuff. Missy Olive, Beth with Opera and Coffee, Megan Miller with Navigation and PKBA Solutions and Dia Scari will all be there. So come up, say what's up, let's enjoy each other's company, maybe make some content, have fun, be safe. And uh, this week is a big piece on how to conference, should be a lot of fun. I want as many people as involved as possible. So I'll see you there.